Today, it's quite amusing to read and watch science fiction works from the end of the last century that predict we should already be conquering distant stars, and interplanetary travel should be a piece of cake. Their predictions seem overly optimistic, as in reality, the only celestial body we can reliably travel to is the Moon. Trips to Mars and possibly Venus are pushing our capabilities to the limit, and according to skeptics, beyond that limits. More distant destinations is currently feasible only for one-way trips, like sending automated spacecraft to Jupiter, Saturn, and more distant objects within the solar system. The challenge lies not only, or not so much, in the slowdown of scientific and technological progress, but rather in the fact that the technology of chemical rockets, which enabled us to leave Earth and venture into space, has largely reached its fundamental limits. To take the next steps into space, we need to make significant advances in scientific and technological fields and create spacecraft that operate on entirely different principles. In this video, we'll discuss some of these principles, potential vehicle designs based on them, and how far we might be able to travel using such technology. But first, let's talk about what's not quite right with our usual and familiar chemical rockets. The principle of their operation is well known. Fuel, such as kerosene, compressed natural gas, or hydrogen, in the combustion chamber reacts chemically with an oxidizer, such as oxygen. The resulting energy heats the gaseous reaction products, causing them to expand and rush out of the rocket nozzle under high pressure. This stream of hot gases carries a specific momentum, and according to the law of conservation of momentum, the rocket starts moving in the opposite direction. The faster the gases leave the nozzle, the faster the rocket flies. So, it's crucial to make the gases move as fast as possible. Unfortunately, the exhaust velocity of chemical rocket engines is quite strictly limited. In a chemical rocket engine, the chemical energy contained in a unit of fuel is converted into the kinetic energy of that same unit of fuel. However, the energy content of a unit of fuel is fixed, referred to as the specific heat of combustion, and for typical rocket propellants, it measures in tens or at best hundreds of thousands of joules per kilogram. Consequently, the maximum theoretically achievable exhaust velocity of the rocket plume won't exceed approximately 4,000 meters per second. And no matter how we design the engines, it won't go any faster. Therefore, if we need our engine to accelerate the spacecraft more rapidly, the only option is to burn more fuel. However, keep in mind that spacecraft has to carry the fuel on its back, because there are no gas stations in space. This means that at each stage of the flight, the energy of burning fuel is not only used to accelerate the spacecraft and its payload, but also to accelerate the mass of the remaining fuel, which the spacecraft will burn during subsequent stages of the journey. In reality, this results in the majority of the energy being spent on accelerating the fuel. For the best modern space rockets, the mass of the payload they deliver to low Earth orbit is no more than 5% of the rocket's initial mass. Moreover, the higher the orbit, the larger the proportion of mass that is taken up by the fuel, and the less payload the rocket can carry. For example, the American SLS rocket is designed to transport the Orion spacecraft with a mass of 25 tons to the moon, while having a launch mass of 2,600 tons. In other words, the useful payload constitutes less than 1% of the rocket's launch mass. And if we take into account that out of these 25 tons, 10 tons will be fuel weight that Orion will use for maneuvers along the way, the efficiency will be as low as 0.6%. And that's just for a lunar mission, the simplest target for space travel among the possibilities. A trip to Mars and Venus will require fuel expenditures many times greater, as the spacecraft not only needs to reach much higher speeds, ideally, no less than 16 km per second compared to the 11 needed for a lunar mission, but also needs to use fuel to reduce velocity when approaching Mars, then accelerate again on the way to Earth, and decelerate once more for re-entry. It's not that this task is entirely unsolvable. We might be able to reach Mars using chemical rockets, though it will push their capabilities to the limit and require significant technical ingenuity, such as in-space refueling. Such schemes are more or less suitable for one-off missions, like planting a flag on the Red Planet. However, we don't have to talk about the systematic colonization or even the exploration of Mars, let alone flights to other planets in the solar system. Therefore, to continue humanity's space odyssey, we need to build engines with much higher energy reserves per unit of fuel mass, meaning engines that provide higher exhaust velocities. Substances with significantly higher internal energy reserves are already known to us. For instance, enriched uranium contains 2.2 billion kilojoules of energy per kilogram, 50,000 times more than one kilogram of the chemical rocket propellant like kerosene. The question is how to convert the hidden nuclear energy in uranium into the kinetic energy of a spacecraft. There are several fundamentally different answers to this question. One of the most extreme concepts was the NASA Project Orion, not to be confused with the modern American Orion, which is planned for lunar missions under the Artemis program. 
The nuclear Orion was designed as a so-called nuclear pulse propulsion system. Massive nuclear charges were to be dropped from the spacecraft's stern, detonating behind it every 100 seconds. The resulting plasma shockwave in the vacuum would push the spacecraft forward, propelling it through space. According to one version of the project, the spacecraft would have a weight of 400,000 tons, with 300,000 tons being reserved for nuclear charges and 50,000 tons for the reflector plate. Calculations show that such a spacecraft could reach 5% of the speed of light in 10 days, allowing it to reach the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, in approximately a century. However, researchers couldn't find a way to protect the crew from the radiation emitted during the detonation. According to calculations, astronauts would receive a lethal dose of radiation after just 10 detonations, which would occur within 15 minutes of the flight. As there is still no truly reliable radiation shielding method to this day, the nuclear pulse propulsion system is not suitable for crewed missions, and even for an unmanned cargo spacecraft. Much of the radiation after the detonation would consist of neutron streams, which can create secondary radiation sources in the traversed materials, resulting in the transported cargo being significantly contaminated as well. But there are less extreme approaches, such as using a nuclear reactor to propel the spacecraft, which refers to the projects of so-called nuclear thermal nuclear propulsion. The principle of operation is quite similar to that of a regular rocket engine. A gas is supplied to an analog of a combustion chamber, where it is heated, but not by the energy from burning fuel, but through heat exchange with energy releasing assemblies heated by nuclear decay inside them. Theoretically, this temperature can be almost arbitrarily high, but in practice, it is limited by the heat resistance of the materials used in the energy releasing assemblies. The use of refractory metals such as molybdenum, tungsten, and rhenium can theoretically raise the temperature to 3 to 3.5 thousand degrees Celsius, compared to temperatures of 1500 to 2000 degrees in the combustion chambers of chemical rocket engines. In other words, the gas will receive a much higher internal energy, which is then converted into its kinetic energy, resulting in a much higher exhaust velocity than chemical rocket engines can achieve. The exhaust velocity of a nuclear rocket engine can reach 7 to 8,000 meters per second, providing roughly twice the fuel efficiency compared to chemical rocket engines. Nuclear rocket engine projects were actively developed in the United States, NERVA program, and the Soviet Union, RD-0410, in the 1970s and 1980s. However, as interest in deep space exploration waned after the end of the Cold War, these projects were shelved. Now, they are gradually making a comeback. In 2022, NASA announced the start or, more accurately, the resumption of work on a rocket with a nuclear thermal propulsion system, known as the Draco project. It is estimated that Draco could transport a human to Mars in 45 days, without the complexities of in-space refueling and similar issues. The drawback of nuclear rocket engines is the need to expel significant amounts of reactive gas, like hydrogen, into open space, which, again, the spacecraft will have to carry on its back. So, while such ships may be able to take us to Venus and Mars, and it's even possible that nuclear thermal rocket engines will become the simplest and most convenient solution for such tasks, we need something else for the systematic exploration of outer planets in the solar system, let alone flights to other stars. This something else is called a nuclear electric propulsion system, which is a hybrid of a nuclear reactor with an ion or plasma thruster. The idea is that heating and expelling gas from the combustion chamber under pressure is not the only way to accelerate the gas in the thruster. An alternative method is accelerating the working fluid particles with an electromagnetic field, but first, these particles need to be ionized, transformed from electrically neutral and indifferent to the field's action into charged particles. Historically, the first in the family of electric propulsion engines were ion thrusters. Gas, usually xenon, is injected into an analog of a combustion chamber, where nothing really burns. Xenon is an inert gas, meaning it poorly reacts chemically with other substances and thus possesses minimal corrosive properties. Additionally, among all inert gases except for radioactive radon, xenon has the largest atomic mass. The chamber contains a metallic electrode that is heated to high temperatures through an electric current. When the electrode heats up sufficiently, a process known as thermionic emission begins, where electrons previously inside the electrode are shot out into the chamber, acquiring significant speed and kinetic energy. This energy must be sufficient to collide with a xenon atom and knock out one or more of its electrons, leaving the atom with an excess positive charge, transforming it into an ion. Thus, a plasma cloud consisting of xenon ions and electrons is formed inside the combustion chamber. This plasma, like any gas-like substance, strives to expand beyond its confined volume, and this expansion is enhanced as we inject more and more gas into the chamber. However, we place two metallic grids in the path of the plasma, applying a positive potential to the inner grid and a negative potential to the outer one.
Due to the internal pressure in the plasma, both electrons and ions pass through the inner grid, with the electric field assisting the electrons while opposing the ions, though not strongly enough to prevent ions from passing through the grid altogether. The situation changes between the grids, the electric field between the grids tries to push the electrons back into the chamber, while the positively charged ions start repelling from the inner grid and attracting to the outer one, resulting in their acceleration towards the nozzle's exit, thus forming a reactive thrust. And here's the most intriguing part, the speed at which ions exit the engine turns out to be virtually unlimited, well, except for the speed of light. Today, ion thrusters exist that can accelerate ions to hundreds of thousands kilometers per second, tens of times faster than chemical and even nuclear rocket engines can achieve. This means that to provide the necessary impulse to our rocket, we need to use extremely small amounts of propellant, and the propellant supply our spacecraft needs to carry becomes quite modest. And this is not science fiction. Such engines have been manufactured since the 1970s and are actively used in space technology. Although currently, they are mostly utilized in small spacecraft like artificial satellites, where they are used for orbit correction. The issue with ion thrusters is that they have a very low thrust. It amounts to only tenths or even hundredths of a newton. Considering that the thruster itself weighs kilograms, or even tens of kilograms without considering the mass of power sources, the acceleration that an ion thruster can provide to a spacecraft will be, at best, tenths of a meter per second per second. Still, this kind of engine can operate for an incredibly long time without refueling, and, after a considerable period, accelerate the spacecraft to high velocities. Over vast distances, a spacecraft equipped with an ion engine will outpace a craft with a chemical rocket engine, which rapidly accelerates but mostly flies through space via inertia. However, when considering the overall travel time for medium distances like those to other planets, including the time for spacecraft acceleration, it still turns out to be prohibitively long. Another example of electric propulsion technology is the so-called Hall effect thrusters. They consist of two nested cylinders, with the cathode, which is the source of electrons similar to the previous example, located inside the inner cylinder. The anode, a positively charged electrode, is positioned inside the thruster, essentially forming the bottom of the cylinder. Coils with current are placed along the walls of both the inner and outer cylinders, creating a magnetic field inside the chamber directed radially from the central cylinder to the outer one. The electrons emitted by the cathode are initially attracted into the thruster by the electrostatic field, but they get influenced by the magnetic field. The Lorentz force, which acts on the electrons, is perpendicular to both the field line's direction and the direction of movement. As a result, the electrons start rotating rapidly around the central cylinder. Now, when we introduce xenon into the system again, these rapidly rotating electrons will ionize the xenon atoms upon collision, turning them into positively charged ions. Now, these ions will be affected by the same electric field that attracted the electrons inside the thruster, but in the opposite direction, pushing them out of the thruster, creating the reactive thrust. Hall thrusters, or as they are sometimes less accurately called, plasma thrusters, have a lower exhaust velocity compared to ion thrusters, around 30,000 meters per second. This means they are less efficient in terms of mass consumption, but they make up for it by generating a thrust tens of times greater. Consequently, spacecraft equipped with Hall thrusters can achieve higher speeds in less time period. Even greater thrust can be harnessed from the so-called magnetoplasmodynamic thrusters, or MPDs. Their general principle of operation is as follows. Plasma, created beforehand using various methods, is introduced into the thruster, which consists, in its simplest form, of two electrodes between which a significant voltage is applied. The plasma, containing charged particles, acts as a conductor of electrical current that flows from the outer electrode to the central one. This current generates a magnetic field, and the Lorentz force, as always, is perpendicular to the direction of the current, meaning it is directed towards the nozzle for ions. The same effect is demonstrated in this video first using water with dissolved salt to improve its conductivity, and then with liquid metal. It's almost the same effect in magnetoplasmodynamic thrusters, but the conductive medium is not metal or an electrolyte, but plasma. Magnetoplasmodynamic thrusters have an exhaust velocity in the tens of thousands of meters per second, and that is definitely nice. Moreover, they are capable of generating impressive thrust in the tens of newtons, hundreds of times more than ion and Hall effect thrusters. However, MPDs also have their challenges, and the primary concern is their limited operational life. To keep the engine running, constant contact between the electrodes and the heated plasma is required, leading to rapid wear of the electrodes. This is critical for low thrust engines because they must continuously accelerate the spacecraft for hundreds of hours to reach the desired velocities. This problem has been addressed in the development of so-called electrodeless magnetoplasmodynamic thrusters, or EMPTs. These engines represent a hybrid of conventional and chemical thrusters. 
Like in chemical rockets, the gas is heating and increasing its internal pressure, and that pressure pushes it out of the engine, creating thrust. However, instead of using combustion energy, EMPTs employ various types of electromagnetic fields to interact with the gas and heat it. For instance, the gas can be ionized not by injecting electrons into the medium, but by passing it through electromagnetic waves of a specific frequency. Then, plasma heating can be accomplished by twisting it along the axis of the thruster using a magnetic or alternating electric field, similar to how electrons rotate in the magnetic field of a Hall effect engine. Part of this plasma's kinetic rotational energy will be converted into the individual motion energy of ions, thus to the temperature of plasma itself. As we discussed earlier, traditional rocket engines reach temperatures of only a few thousand degrees Celsius at best. However, inside the EMPT, we're talking about heating the plasma to tens of millions of degrees. Then, this superheated plasma flow is directed into a nozzle. The result is a flow of superheated plasma exiting the engine at speeds on the order of tens of thousands of meters per second. Moreover, the flow density can be relatively easily controlled, achieving thrust levels of tens or even hundreds of newtons. The most famous project using this type of engine is the Vasimir by the American company Ad Astra Rockets, although similar projects are also being developed by Russian company Energomash, the European Space Agency, and Chinese researchers from the Harbin Institute of Technology. However, electrodeless magnetoplasmodynamic thrusters have their weaknesses. Due to their many subsystems and devices, they tend to have relatively high mass, which can be a critical drawback for relatively low thrust engines. In addition to that, all electric propulsion engines, regardless of the type, face some common problems. For example, even the most powerful electric propulsion engines will not generate enough thrust to overcome Earth's gravity. Therefore, ordinary rockets are likely to be used to launch nuclear-powered spacecraft into orbit, either fully assembled or in parts for subsequent assembly in space. In other words, chemical rockets will remain essential workhorses for near-Earth space exploration. Nevertheless, the main challenge with all electric propulsion engines lies elsewhere. They require an external power source, and if the engine is powerful enough, a highly productive power source is needed. The only viable option seems to be a nuclear reactor, but integrating it into a spacecraft poses a series of complex technical problems. The main issue is how to manage excess heat. In reality, only about a third of the thermal energy produced during fuel fission inside the reactor can be converted into electricity. The rest has to be dumped into the surrounding environment. Large structures, like those near many nuclear power plants, are cooling towers designed to solve this problem. They cool the water heated by nuclear energy. However, in space, there is no medium to dump the excess heat. Discarding the hot coolant is not an option either because there is no way to replenish it. The only viable cooling method is through thermal radiation, a phenomenon where any object heated to a certain temperature emits electromagnetic waves. Unfortunately, thermal radiation is not a highly efficient cooling method. Its power is determined by the Stefan Boltzmann law and is proportional to the surface area of the radiating body and the fourth power of its temperature. Therefore, for the system to be truly effective, the reactor's operating temperature must be quite high, around one and a half to two or even more thousand degrees Celsius, rather than the hundreds of degrees used in terrestrial reactors. This imposes entirely different requirements on the technologies and materials used in such reactors. At present, Russia is the most systematic in reporting progress on the development of such a reactor, known as a nuclear electric propulsion system of the megawatt class. However, even in Russia's case, there are many challenges along the way. For example, even with such high temperatures in the reactor, achieving the required cooling intensity would require enormous antenna radiator surfaces, and in the classical execution of this scheme, the mass of these antennas would be quite significant. Likely faced with these and other technical challenges, NASA seems to have decided to focus on nuclear thermal rockets within its Draco program. While the Russian nuclear-powered spacecraft promises to be launched into space by 2030, NASA aims to achieve it by 2027. It appears that the long-awaited technological breakthrough in space technology could happen very soon. In just a couple of decades, missions to Mars, Venus, and even beyond may become routine or at least not incredibly sensational events. However, interstellar travel still remains a matter of the distant future. Although there are some intriguing ideas in this direction, they seem to be quite far from realization. But we'll discuss them in one of our upcoming videos. Please subscribe and enable notifications by pushing a bell to stay tuned.